بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My name is Hassan Shibli I'm an attorney and executive director of Care Florida and I'll also be joining you inshallah this year as one of the Hajj coordinators with Sarah International Travel uh, We're going to talk a little bit today about how to benefit the most from this blessed trip with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's tawfiq and blessing you know, one of the amazing things is when I review some of the questions that people send before they go to Hajj, the majority of the questions tend to be about accommodations, hotels, where we're staying, how many days, and all things that are very important, especially as people are sacrificing so much of their time, their wealth, their energy to go on this trip, and they want to make sure it goes as planned. And then after that, you have, so the majority of the questions are on the accommodation and then a lot of questions on fiqh, which is very important too. We need to know the proper rulings to make sure that our hajj is accepted. It's very unfortunate that many people these days go with people that they don't tr uh, that maybe haven't been learned in the Islamic sciences and they haven't studied the proper monastic, the proper rulings of hajj and may do things that may either invalidate the hajj or require them offering sacrifice and other such things. So obviously accommodation is important and then the fiqh aspect is very important and people tend to ask questions about these two areas and it's always important that we ask from those with knowledge but then after that very few people ask the most critical question which is how can we gain the most spiritual benefit from Hajj and what is the purpose of this Hajj that I'm going on really the purpose very simply after fulfilling the fard of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilling our obligation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made mandatory and we know the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made it very clear that whoever has the resources to go to Hajj and doesn't it, and he passes away, it doesn't matter whether he passes away as a Jew or a Christian. So that doing the Hajj when it becomes obligatory upon us is part of fulfilling our Iman and our duty as Muslims. And that's why for those of us going, and many of us may have friends that are doctors, lawyers, engineers, people who are wealthy and have the resources but haven't done Hajj, remember it is not permissible to delay it. And unfortunately sometimes we make fake excuses that prohibit us from going to Hajj, right? My practice is busy. Well, alhamdulillah, if we have enough resources and wealth to take care of ourselves and our family, we can put our practice on hold. This is very important. We don't know how long we will, we will live. And what a shame it is to live in this country, America. You know, subhanAllah, people in the Middle East, maybe they wait years and their whole life till they get a spot to go to Hajj. And here in America, we can go to Hajj every single year if we want to. And yet so many of us, unfortunately, have the resources and we don't go. So it's very important. First, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He blessed us to go inshallah this year together and then we remind ourselves and our brothers and our sisters and our family members because we have to love for them what we love for ourselves and the essence of Hajj right is to strengthen and re-establish our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to build a love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to recognize that Allah is qareeb fa'inni qareeb that he is near to us that he's close to us to go searching and seeking his pleasure as one of the poets has written you know that which you seek is seeking you we seek Allah but before we even seek Allah, know that Allah is seeking us. He loves us. He wants to build a relationship with us. You know, and the unfortunate thing, you know, Allah doesn't turn away from people, but we often turn away from Allah. We often get distracted with the many blessings He gave you. He gave us. You know, why do people turn away from Allah frequently? It's because of the blessings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. So He gives us a lot of wealth. He gives us a lot of the toys of this dunya. And we become so distracted over our wealth, over our careers, over our positions, over all these material things that we often forget to build a relationship with the one who gave us everything. And that's why it's critical. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal insan, ma gharraka bi rabbikal kareem, O human being, what has diluted you from your most generous Lord? And subhanAllah, the answer to that question is within the question itself it's often Allah's generosity that lets us turn away from him as we become lost in the dunya this material world the pursuit of which will never end until we taste the earth in death and we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave us everything and as the poets have written and some of those who are have worked to build a relationship with Allah have written you know what has he found he who has lost you ya Allah and what has he lost he who has gained you our connection with Allah is the source of our peace of mind, is the source of our happiness. And that's what we all want as human beings. We want to be happy, we want to have peace of mind. And we have to recognize that that's only found through our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, we just finished this blessed month of Ramadan and the point of Ramadan is really not just to turn our, our stomachs away from food and drink and to turn our bodies away from intimate relations, but really to turn our hearts away from the material world and turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because out of Allah's rahmah and His mercy, He recognizes that throughout the year we may get busy in this material world. 
and in in as what they call here in the West the rat race, you know, just trying to get more and more. Al hakum that the competition for increase, competition for getting more, distracts you from the true reality, which is death, and our meeting with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and our hearts become hard. This is why the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, although when he was out there, he wasn't out there just to do business or gain in his material world. He was out there doing da'wah. But just by being in the company of the mushrikeen, as he was calling them to Islam, he says, "I do istighfar seventy times a day. Why?" Because I feel that dust may come on my heart, so I want to keep my heart clean of that dust. So I seek Allah's forgiveness over 70 times a day to keep my heart pure. So imagine if the Prophet ﷺ felt the desire to do istighfar 70 times a day just to make sure his heart remains spotless. What about us in this material world? And he was doing da'wah and we're out in our business. How much more do we have a need to re-establish that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this blessed month of Ramadan was an opportunity for us to turn away from the dunya the pursuit of which never ends and turn our hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before it's too late. Allah says, أَلَمْ يَأْنِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Hasn't it become time for those that believe that their hearts become soft for the remembrance of Allah, the one whom we will return to, the one who cherishes us, who loves us, who provides for us, who sustains us, who takes care of all of our needs? And that's the sad thing is nowadays, because our connection with Allah has become weak, our stress levels have become high, our worry has become high, our anxiety has become high, because we've put our faith and our trust into all the worldly means, and not in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why subhanAllah, sometimes you find people that are living paycheck to paycheck, they have more peace of mind than the people who literally have millions in the bank. And I know this, being an attorney, I do a lot of estate planning. And subhanAllah, sometimes I have clients living paycheck to paycheck, and you find that they have the utmost peace of mind in the stress-free life. Why? Because they know every month Allah provides for them as their needs are. And then you have some people, and again, never to judge others, but to take an example for our own selves that we learn in our life, that have, mashallah, so much wealth and resources, but you know, you find signs that the trust is in the resources and is in the wealth as in and is in the bank accounts and is not in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as it should be. That's why you find high levels of stress. So Allah loves us and He wants us to have the peace of mind. He wants us to love nothing truly but Him and those whom He commanded us to love. He wants us to have faith in nothing but Him. He wants us to have trust in nothing but Him. He wants us to call and to ask upon nothing but Him. And you find the Hajj trip is really an embodiment of all those lessons to turn away from the dunya that we wear for the brothers, the two white sheets that we may be buried in, right? That we turn away from our position, our wealth, our status, you know, the rich, the poor, the ruler and the ruled all equal standing before Allah without any differentiation even in dress. And that we put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that we build our connection with Allah through dua. A dua mukhul ibadah, that prayer, that calling upon Allah is the essence, is the core of worship. And subhanAllah, the, the blessed trip of Hajj, we learned that a big part of this Hajj is the dua, speaking to Allah. You know, unfortunately, nowadays as a community, many of us have turned away from dua. We find that during the uh, salah time, just look around in your masjid. How many people unfortunately are deprived of the blessing of dua after salah? Assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum. And right away we get up and we run to the dunya that we may have been thinking about the whole time while we were standing before Rabbul Alameen. When we say Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. He's greater than my job. He's greater than my worries. He's greater than everything that may distract me. And yet I'm sitting and thinking about my business and my job and all these things. Even though I just said Allah was greater. Was I lying when I said Allahu Akbar? And then when the salah finishes, right away we get up. How many people are deprived of dua? And then even from those who are blessed with dua, how many people are only limiting the dua to formal supplications that they neither contemplate about nor do they understand? And the formal supplications are critical and very important, right? From the, especially the du'as from the Qur'an and the du'as from the sunnah. Those are very important and very weighty in our scale of deeds, inshaAllah. But that is just one step. Then there's the dua, the supplication where we actually speak to Allah as if He is qareeb, as if He is near to us. You know, our mashayikh have taught us that when you make dua, you should speak as if somebody is very close to you. Somebody loves you. Somebody who wants to help you and somebody who can help you. And you have a need, that's how you speak to Him. So SubhanAllah say, you know, as a young child, uh, maybe just moved out of their parents' home and they went through a difficulty and they know their parents love them so much. So how do they approach their father or their mother? saying, you know, you've given me so much and sometimes I've misused the things you've given me, but you, you, you've still been so generous to me. 
and you keep giving me and giving me, even though I've made mistakes in the past, and now I've really made a mistake, and now I really need your help. And I know you love me. I know you want to help me. And I know you can help me. And I know nobody can help me but you. Please help me. Not because of anything I've done. You know, I make so much mistakes and I'm filled with so many faults. But out of your generosity, out of your love, and that's how we should speak to Allah. Ya Allah, don't treat me according to what I've done, because if you do, I'll be destroyed. But treat me according to your love, according to your generosity, according to your mercy, Ya Allah. Fulfill my needs. In this world and the next, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes some people that some people say, Rabbana atina fid dunya. Ya Allah, just give us in the dunya. When they make dua, all they do care about is asking about the dunya. And there are the believers, however, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Oh Allah, give us beauty and good in this world. Ya Allah, give us beauty and good in the hereafter and save us from the hellfire. Look, they're asking, they're making dua to be saved from the hellfire. How often do we as individuals make dua that Allah saves us from the hellfire? Or do we just take it for granted, oh, I'm going to enter paradise? Like the people of the book did before us. Those were the mistakes and the Prophet ﷺ warned us not to make the same mistakes as the people of the book made before us, just assuming they will enter paradise. No, Allah describes the believers that they make the dua, وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Ya Allah, save us from the torment of the hellfire. The essence is ibadah, because ibadah shows humility, humbleness. It shows that we fear His punishment and that we have hope in His mercy. It shows that we fear and love no one but Him. So taking us back to the main point is the Hajj, is the ideal opportunity to learn trusting in Allah. And SubhanAllah, for those of you that have been on Hajj and Umrah before, we know there's millions of people and sometimes, you know, no matter how hard we try and you try, we may get lost, we may end up without, you know, uh, again, mistakes happen, maybe somebody gets separated from the group, he ends up without his money, he ends up without any uh, food, and yet he trusts in Allah and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala brings him back from ways you never expect. So you learn trusting in Allah, you learn talking to Allah, you learn making dua to Allah, you learn building a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Recognize Allah is with me, Allah sees me, Allah hears me, Allah loves me, Allah wants to help me, Allah can help me, and no one can help me but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to establish that, that connection and that peace of mind. And the Hajj is the ideal opportunity, my dear brothers and sisters, to do that. So as I was starting my talk, that the unfortunate reality is very few of us often think about these questions. You know. How can I strengthen my connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this trip? Otherwise, you know, just like Ramadan again was a great example, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, كَمْ مِنْ صَائِمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ مِنْ صِيَامِهِ إِلَّا الْضَمَامِ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَنِهِ صَلَاةُ وَسَلَامِ That how many people fast and get nothing from their fast except hunger? And how many people come in qa'im and laysa lahum min qiyamihi illa sahar aw kama qal alayhi salatu wasalam? How many people stay up at night and get nothing from staying up at night except staying up and gaining no spiritual benefit and no reward. And there are many people, unfortunately, who maybe they go for Hajj, they spend thousands of dollars, but because they didn't have the right intention, or because they tried to show off, or because they were arrogant, or because they broke one of the rules and principles of Hajj, they come back empty-handed and six, seven thousand dollars empty, short, and no spiritual gain, uh, and, and, and not strengthening their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from being those people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of the people whose hajj is accepted. And not only our hajj is accepted, but may Allah make us of the people who, because of our sincerity and our love and our dedication to Allah, that everyone Hajj is accepted. And yes, there's stories where it's uh, related that sometimes just because of one or two pious people in the group, the entire group's Hajj is accepted. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those people. You know, uh, the, the pious predecessors, subhanAllah, when they used to go to Hajj, they were afraid to say, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik. Because when you say Labbaik, you're saying, Here I am, O Allah. And there are some people, maybe Allah will respond, La Labbaik, there's, there's no, there, you're not welcome here. And do we know when we say Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik, is Allah welcoming us? Or is He saying, No, I don't need, you know, I'm not accepting it? And again, that depends on our intention. And inshallah, take it as a very good sign. We should always have the utmost hope in Allah that the fact that Allah has put in our heart the desire to go for Hajj, has given us the means to go for Hajj, and now tawfiq, hopefully by this point, to have registered and gotten uh, sent in our paperwork for our visas and our tickets and make accommodation for our family and our travel, that inshallah, Allah is too generous to invite us without accepting us. 
But nonetheless, we have to hope and we have to try and we have to make dua. That's why, as I said, dua mukhul ibadah. You know, when we pray, what's the sunnah afterwards? To do dua afterwards. Why? One of the many hikmas and reasons, subhanAllah, is we may do the dua, but our dua, our salah, but our salah may be filled with so many uh, deficiencies. And that's where the dua comes in. Ya Allah, I've offered you, subhanAllah, what our mashayikh have given an example that when you, you know, you're offering your salah, it's like going to a wedding and offering a gift, but what gift are you offering? You're offering them a bottle of water. You know, something that's really insignificant. And subhanAllah, and, but with our salah, it's filled with so many deficiencies. It's like offering the person a dirty bottle of water. You're saying, here, this is what I'm giving for you. And subhanAllah, Allah out of His generosity and love for us and graciousness accepts it from us. So that's the point of du'a is that you make du'a, Ya Allah, I know I've given you something so insignificant because of my deficiencies and my faults. Ya Allah, I know the salah that I just did, maybe, uh, you know, I, I didn't perfect it as I should have perfected it. Ya Allah, I know my heart got distracted thinking about the dunya and these other things, but Ya Allah, of your generosity, please accept it. Please help me perfect my ibadah. Please help me beautify my ibadah. So to make that du'a and ask for acceptance, maybe the salah itself was deficient. Hopefully all the faraid and sunnahs were fulfilled and nowadays even that's doubtful. How many people unfortunately you see doing sujood and their toes are all the way up in the air possibly breaking their salah and they never studied the faraid of salah. You know, we sometimes study everything, engineering, law, science, but we don't take an hour to study the faraid from a good teacher or a good source of how to do our prayer. So assuming the faraid are complete, but there's still some spiritual deficiencies in where our heart was, what we were thinking about, what we were, uh, how our strong our focus and our connection was. So we make dua to Allah, Ya Allah, out of your generosity, Please accept my prayer. And maybe it's through the dua, even though the prayer was deficient, but through sincere dua, Allah accepts it for us. Otherwise, there's people whom salah, when they do a salah or a good deed, it's folded up like a dirty rag the Prophet ﷺ taught us and thrown back in the person's face. So this is why dua, humility, and that's the theme we're going to learn and we're really talking about today. Hopefully you've picked up on it. The essence of Islam, and as you read the Qur'an, one of the most important qualities is humility. The Qur'an came as to teach us to be humble before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And really, the, one of the best good deeds is to be humble. Truly humble, sincerely humble before Allah. And one of the worst of sins is arrogance. And arrogance is the source of many of our problems. Whether it's kufr, disbelief in Allah, is a sign, is coming from arrogance, of course, thinking we're independent. Or community, infighting, problems, division, a lot of it is coming from arrogance and that's as we know the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then it helps us understand you know in the hadith where he said that a person who has a mustard seed of arrogance in their heart will not enter paradise until it is cleaned or removed so arrogance is very destructive and humility is is, is very empowering very strengthening uh, it helps us strengthen our connection with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's one of the themes we're going to talk about throughout hajj making sure we step on our nafs we step on our ego we get rid of any arrogance we may have and we act with humility because through humility we'll be able to get along with our fellow hajis and travelers in a, in a time that could be very difficult with millions of people all trying to do the same thing at the same time and also it'll keep our connection with Allah strong and that's what Islam is about really strengthening our connection with Allah and strength, uh, strengthening our connection with Allah and strengthening our connection with each other and Hajj is a great exercise for accomplishing that with Allah's help and tawfiq inshallah so my dear brothers and sisters watching this to succeed in our Hajj journey, we truly have to prepare. And we have to prepare before Hajj. You know, somebody who's going on a big marathon, they don't expect to succeed in the marathon and the first day they start jogging or running is the day of the marathon. That doesn't make sense. No, somebody who cares about a simple marathon, really ask your friends, any of those in, in athletics that maybe participate in marathons or competitive sports, you know, how long before the marathon or the event they may start exercising and preparing for it. Really, those that succeed have put in a lot of time preparing for it. And same way in Hajj, we really, if we want to succeed in our Hajj, we have to prepare for it. And still, unfortunately, subhanAllah, it's true, a lot of people, they start preparing for Hajj by jogging or walking, trying to prepare their physical bodies. That's, okay, that's important, but really not as important as training our souls. Getting in the habit of doing the amal salah, the good deeds. Getting in the habit of perfecting our good character pushing down against our nafs, against our arrogance, pushing, uh, strengthening our humility. And arrogance is a dangerous thing. You know, the scholars have written and said that somebody who thinks he's not arrogant, that's a sign of his arrogance. And somebody who thinks he's humble, that's a sign he's not maybe really humble. You know, sometimes, subhanAllah, you go in a gathering and there's no place to sit except on the floor. So you think, oh, I'm being so humble, I'm sitting on the floor. 
Well, that means because you think you're being humble by sitting on the floor, that means you think you're really above sitting on the floor. You should be sitting on the couch, but by sitting on the floor, you're being humble. That means you really think something of yourself and that shows that maybe you're not truly humble. So we really have to start put working on getting the good qualities before Hajj so we're ready when we're in Hajj. Whether it is increasing our good deeds, our dua, getting the habit of making dua to Allah, getting the habit of recognizing and feeling in our hearts that we are with Allah at all times. Allah is with us. Allah sees us. Allah hears us. Allah loves us as I've spoken about before. Getting the habit of building that connection with Allah, getting in the habit of doing the good qualities and the good deeds, and getting in the habit of having the good characteristics that will help us succeed in Hajj. Again, like humility, sabr, patience. Patience is a big one on Hajj. Don't try to come to Hajj without patience. Otherwise, you, you'll fail miserably because Hajj is a time when people show uh, uh, really there are times to, to have patience in Hajj. SubhanAllah. And Allah, what is the reward of patience? And our patience is nothing really. It's very simple. We're sitting in air-conditioned buses. Maybe we have to wait for an hour or two until traffic clears. That's nothing. Sahaba radiallahu and the people in previous times, they used to uh, spend six months traveling on foot and on camel back to get to Hajj. And we just have, we complain about sitting in a couple hours with an air-conditioned bus. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to have the proper sabr, the proper shukr, and the proper good qualities. So again, we got to start from now building within ourselves the good qualities and the good actions that will strengthen uh, and help us have the good Hajj. And we're going to talk a little bit about those very shortly, inshallah, in the time that we have remaining. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا رفث ولا فسوق ولا جدال في الحج. That Hajj, for it to be accepted, there should be no رفث, no obscenity. And for people, you really need to look into that. For example, those traveling with their partners, there should be no sort of intimate talk when we are in ihram or even alluding to intimate relations. This is a time when we really should turn our hearts to Allah, just like when we are fasting. ولا فسوق, no, no wickedness, no transgression, no sin. You know, as they say in Mecca, subhanAllah, where the good deeds are multiplied many times, even the sin is multiplied because these are sacred grounds. And to go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to commit the sins, that's really uh, very, very uh, difficult and very troubling. So we have to be careful to stay away from all wickedness. That's a critical thing for our, for our hajj to be accepted. Finally, وَلَا جِدَالِ Not even arguing. Allah says, لَا جِدَالِ not even arguing in Hajj. And arguing, I mean, while it's disliked, technically it may not necessarily be fallen into the category of haram, depending on what you fall into, what you're talking about and how you're saying it. But still, when we do Hajj, wala jidal, no arguing, no wrangling uh, during Hajj. And that means we really have to control our character. And it's just so sad, subhanAllah, when you go for Hajj and you see a brother accidentally bumps into a brother and the other brother yells at him and then he starts yelling back and they fall into it. and subhanAllah these brothers both spent five six seven thousand dollars to come on this hajj and they just ruined it all for nothing over a misunderstanding or bumping into one another in fact I say that's the beauty of hajj subhanAllah that when you're walking and somebody bumps into you you bump into them you don't even speak the same language so you smile and say salam alaikum they smile and they say salam alaikum back and alhamdulillah you continue on your merry way subhanAllah let everything in hajj let every taste of hardship be a means thinking of this is getting me closer to Allah. That this is the most physically I've ever had to struggle for Allah. And really the reality is for most of us, in fact, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said that the jihad of women is performing hajj. He taught us that. So for most of us, this is the strongest and the greatest physical struggle we'll have to offer to Allah. It's the greatest physical sacrifice we will ever offer in our life for this deen for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should really enjoy any hardship we taste or we go through saying Alhamdulillah, I'm going through this for Allah and I know my reward is with Allah. So enjoy it and never let it become a source of arguing. As I said, we have to be careful from these three things. La rafath, no, no obscenity. La fusuq, no uh, transgression, wickedness. Wala jidal, not even arguing. And you, the only way you'll be able to pull that off, again, is if you work on the other qualities we spoke about. Sabr, being patient, and humility, and fighting back against arrogance. And from that, we can really say that part of Hajj is to help us perfect our character. And SubhanAllah, the blessed Prophet Muhammad وسلم, taught us that even with doing a few good deeds, as long as we have good character, we can get high levels in paradise. As long as we fulfill the fara'id, of course. That character leads to Jannah. SubhanAllah, what a beautiful religion Islam is. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam taught us that some of the best good deeds is to help somebody fulfill their need or accomplish their goal. You know, somebody's working or carrying a burden and you help them. If you can't do that, then at least remove difficulty from people or people's path. If you can't do that, then at least, at the very least, and this is still considered a good deed, 
Avoid people you're shar, you're evil. Don't be a source of harm or inconvenience or trouble for others. And that's the mentality we have to go with on Hajj. That in Hajj, I will not be a burden for any of the guests of Allah. I do not want to be an inconvenience for any of the guests of Allah. Recognize that everyone on Hajj is a guest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the guests of Allah. You don't want to trouble the guests of Allah. If somebody troubles you or harms you, Alhamdulillah, I forgive them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's no problem. I'll forgive others because I want Allah to forgive me. How many times do I make mistakes and Allah continues to forgive me? So I want to keep forgiving others. If anybody troubles me, Alhamdulillah, I forgive them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want to be the source of another Muslim's hajj being rejected. So I'm going to forgive them. But no matter what, I don't want to be a source of trouble for any of the hajjis, for any of the guests of Allah. Try not to inconvenience anyone. In fact, sometimes there's maybe more reward in not harming your fellow Muslim than there is for doing a nafil prayer. That's true. So if you're in a bus or in an airplane and everyone's sleeping and you know, mashallah, these people are tired, they're going for hajj, they need their energy, they're trying to rest up and then you start reciting Quran loudly and you wake the people next to you up, well maybe it would have been better for you to recite it quietly than as opposed to disturbing all the hajjis around you. So make sure we make intention not to be a source of inconvenience for anyone. And inshallah, I mean, for these 10, 20 days that we're together, if you really work and perfect, and again, you have to start from now so you get used to these habits and these good qualities, then inshallah, these good qualities will remain with you. And wallahi, Allah loves the people who are only a source of good for each other, not a source of inconvenience or harm or difficulty for other people. You know, subhanAllah, the, the, those that lived wicked lives, you know, the earth and the sky, Allah says, they do not cry upon them when they die. But the believer, the earth and the skies, cries a, 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 about them when they die. Why? Because they were a source of good and mercy for the creation. And they were a source where all the good deeds used to go up, you know, in the sema and the heaven, our doors where all our good deeds rise to. So the heavens actually miss, miss the good deeds that used to go up, especially the good deeds of us serving each other being there for each other. In a time when our ummah is going through so much difficulty worldwide, this is a really time when we need to have the mercy and the love for each other. That is one of the greatest good deeds. So Hajj is about perfecting character. Let's start working and reforming on our character now. Forgiving each other, being patient and not being a source of difficulty. As I said, character is the ways of getting the highest of Jannah. And sabr, having patience. Endure it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I said, we're very blessed that inshallah in this, in this Hajj, you know, we may get some opportunities to get our bodies tired for the sake of Allah. You read about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every night his feet would get swollen as he stood praying before Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for me and you. His feet, his blessed feet would be swollen. And the Sahaba, how much love they had for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of the Sahaba, when he was about to be executed, they said, wouldn't you rather the Prophet be in your place and you with your family? He said, if me being with my family meant the Prophet would be pricked by a thorn, I wouldn't bear it. They didn't want to cause any inconvenience, even if it meant saving their lives just for the Prophet being pricked by a thorn, they wouldn't accept it. And yet the Prophet وسلم, he went through so much hardship just for me and you, standing with his feet being swollen, praying and crying for us. And the question is, how often have our feet gotten swollen crying for our own selves or praying before Allah or standing? So Alhamdulillah, this Hajj may be an opportunity where at least we can show Allah at least once in our lifetime that our body, just as we've made it tired so often, disobeying Allah unfortunately. Just as we've made our body so tired so often just seeking the dunya. And that'll be really embarrassing that Allah shows us, you know, you've made your body sweat and get tired so much just seeking the world. Now show me how many times your body got sweated and got tired and swollen and sore from seeking my pleasure. We don't want to be those people that we show Allah we've gotten so tired seeking the dunya and not once we've gotten tired seeking His pleasure. So this Hajj is a great opportunity for us to at least once in our lifetime get tired seeking the pleasure of Allah physically, offering some mujahada, some struggle, uh, trying to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for many of us, it may be the most physical struggle we ever go through for the sake of Allah. So let's enjoy that. Let's have patience. Let's forgive and not be a source of inconvenience for each other. Also, we have to, as I mentioned in the previous talk, set goals for our ibadah. How much Quran we wish to read every day. How much adhkar. Keep a tasbih with you. Set a goal. Don't waste your time in hajj talking. And that's such a shame. You know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in the days of hajj, especially in the days when we're in the tents for two, three days, um, Allah says we should remember Allah uh, more than we remember our forefathers. You know, because in the days of Jahiliya, they used to sit there and just talk about their forefathers and, and, and their tribes and their families. Allah says, no, you should be remembering Allah at this time. So use every free moment to build a connection with Allah. Dhikr, 
is the greatest and easiest act of ibadah, just remembrance of Allah. And I highly encourage you pick up a book, maybe Fadail al Dhikr by Shaykh Al Hadith Muhammad Zakari Kan Dahlawi, or many of the other books that are out there on the benefits of Dhikr and read it beforehand to encourage you to increase the Dhikr, the remembrance of Allah, the Tasbihat, and the good deeds. That's very, very important in this time. And and if you notice, you know, our teachers, subhanAllah, they would keep a Tasbih with them. And when they notice somebody talking too much, they would give them Tasbih, remind them, stay in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. Don't don't waste time talking because talking at best case you've wasted time that's the best you know unless you're talking teaching somebody and you have knowledge or you're encouraging good deeds or you're fixing relations or something that's really beneficial and necessary and nobody else can do it then inshallah there's some benefit but otherwise most of the talking we do at best case you've wasted time and this is a time when every good deed is multiplied by a hundred thousand. So you say subhanAllah once in the haram and you maybe give, get the reward of a hundred thousand subhanAllahs or even more. Do you really have time to waste a hundred thousand subhanAllahs? You don't have that time. Use every single moment to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because talking, as I mentioned, at best you're wasting time and at worst you're burning your good deeds away. Because it could lead to rafat fusuq or, or jidal, it could lead to backbiting, it could lead to arguing. And how often, sometimes we start praising somebody and then we say, oh, he's good, but you know, they has, he has this one problem of, uh, in his la hawla wa la quwwata illa Just by doing that, we've fallen into backbiting. Or he's good, but you know what, I'm going to stay quiet, I don't want to mention. Just when you say, oh, he's good, but, and I'm going to stay quiet, that in itself is backbiting. So be very careful because talking either on the, on the one side, it'll waste your time. On the other side, it will actually lead you to destroying and actually just giving the entire reward of the Hajj to the people whom you back with or whose rights you have wronged or whom you have argued with. So it's very important that we make the most of our time, have, good de have a set of goals. Tasbihat, Adhkar, Quran, and Dua. Again, Tasbihat and Adhkar, Quran and Dua. Quran, as we know, is one of the greatest acts of ibadah. And do the best thing that the, for the time that you're in. You know, often we go to Mecca and you find some people just doing multiple Amras. That's fine, but really the scholars have written that, and it's clear from the Quran as well, that the most rewarding thing to do in the Haram is the Tawaf. So in the Haram, don't waste time. Try to do as much Tawaf as possible. You know, some of the people they would go, they would do 50 Tawaf, 70 Tawaf. 20 tawaf, whatever it is that we can do. And each tawaf is only is seven times around. So you multiply that by 50. Try to do as much tawaf as possible because that's the only place you can do uh, tawaf in the world really is Mecca. So make the most of the opportunity in Medina. Try to send a lot of blessings on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He hears you and he responds personally. Just try to strengthen your connection with the Prophet through Salah and Nabi. And then in both places and in the buses and the travels, uh, read a lot of Quran. Read Quran. That is the, one of the greatest ways to get close to Allah. We know otherwise the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam complains to Allah, Ya Allah, my people took this Quran as something to be neglected. And that's the reality in our time. So many people, they spend so much time on everything except Allah's book. How many of our youth, hours on Facebook, no time for Allah's book. It's a shame. So use this opportunity, especially subhanAllah, as you're traveling Mecca and Medina, you see, you look, this is where this ayah was revealed. This is where this surah was revealed. This is where the Quran came on the blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So use that time to reestablish your connection with Allah. Everyone on this trip should at least, at least, at least try to finish one khatam. In fact, one khatam in Mecca, one khatam in Medina, if possible, and even more than that. Try to read Quran again. Let's keep our schedule busy. No time for talking, no time for wasting uh, our time. Just do try to fill our time with three things. Dua, Quran, and Adhkar, the uh, Subhanallah, Tasmih, Istighfar, Salah, and Nabi. And then, of course, doing the, the manasik, doing the tawaf and the other things to the best of our ability as much as we can. Let our bodies get tired to the worship of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And remember Dua, Dua, I cannot emphasize it enough, talking to Allah while you're doing Sa'i, back and forth, just pray to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Talk to Allah. He's, remember, and when you do Dua, remember these things. He is close to you. He loves you. He wants to help you, He can help you, and only He can help you. Remember these points. He's close to you, He loves you, He wants to help you, He can help you, and He's the only one that can help you. And He will be angry with you if you don't ask Him. That's the difference between us, one of the, uh, you know, uh, a difference, subhanAllah, in the quality that, that uh, uh, between humankind and Allah, of course, uh, 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 you cannot count the differences, but this is a very important, subhanAllah, beautiful difference that from people, the more you ask of them, the more the angry they get with you. Then they start avoiding you. Uh, then they don't pick up your phone or respond to your message, the more you ask of them. But Allah is the opposite. 
the more you ask him, the more he loves you because it shows that you love no one but him, that you trust in no one but him. You truly believe, La ilaha illallah, no one can help me, no one can harm me except Allah. So use this opportunity as a time for dua. Fill your time with dua, dhikr, or Quran. I cannot overemphasize that throughout the travels from the day you, you, you depart on the Hajj till the day you return. And inshallah, then we'll get in the habit of continuing that when we are back from Hajj. And remember, my dear brothers and sisters, that when we come back from Hajj, inshallah, especially after the day of Arafah, if Allah accepts from us, we will come back, inshallah, as the day our mothers gave birth to us, free from sin. Don't ruin that. Try to stay free from sin. If you make any mistakes, ask Allah for forgiveness right away and keep up the good qualities you've picked up on this Hajj journey. And these refer to Hukukullah and Hukuk al Ibad. And that's what we have to be very, very, be very careful. Allah will forgive us all the hukuk, all of the wrongs we might have done towards Him. Of course, if we have salah, we still have to make it up. If we owe zakah, we still have to pay it, make up our fast and whatever things we've missed. However, be careful with hukuk al-ibad. And that's why it's very important that before we go for hajj, we seek forgiveness for any wrong we've done to people so we can truly come back fresh. Because it's easy, you make a sin between you and Allah, you make dua, you make it up and Allah forgives you. But if you've wronged people and you've stolen people, how many people they go on hajj, yet they've cheated their business partners, they've stolen, they've backbite. Make sure you fix all these things before you go for hajj. So that when you come back, you're truly pure and free from sin. Then don't wrong anyone during the hajj trip. Make sure, as I said, people wrong you, alhamdulillah, I forgive them for the sake of Allah, as sadaqah, I forgive them. And but I won't wrong anyone. And when you come back, try to make sure we be careful with people's rights. And that's a big tragedy in our time, is that even the so-called religious, quote-unquote, people, you find us, maybe uh, them doing all the good deeds outwardly, but then maybe lacking in how we interact with each other and in our characters, in our business, in our morals, in how we talk to one another, in how we consider each other's feelings or business uh, and trade and all these things. So be very, very careful never to wrong anyone because it's much more dangerous to harm actually the, the hukuk of ibad many times. You know the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you know, who's, who, do you know who the bankrupt person? They said, yeah, the one who lost his money. He said, no, the bankrupt person is who worshipped Allah abundantly, you know, did hajj, did umrah, ch fasted, but he hurt this person, he backbit this person, he cheated this person. And we find this common, unfortunately. How many times Muslims don't like to do business with other Muslims? That's a shame. The first people we should want to do Muslim uh, business with is each other. But we've lost trust sometimes in some communities. We don't want to be those people who we've done so many good deeds, but then all our good deeds go to the people whom we hurt, as the Prophet ﷺ warned in that hadith. So be very careful not to hurt each other. And remember, humility is the essence of our religion. Allah loves the humble. He loves those that are humble. Humility is the key. And if you're humble on this trip, you won't hurt anyone. You won't be angry. You won't be impatient. Why? You recognize, Alhamdulillah, I am lucky to be here. Really, I'm blessed to be here. If Allah treated me according to my own deeds, I wouldn't even be here today. It doesn't matter how much wealth or position or respect or what they call me in my town or city. I'm a this, I'm a that. It doesn't matter. If, if people knew my reality, they wouldn't even let me here. And Allah, even though He knows my rea reality, He's hiding my faults. And through His generosity, He's allowing me to be here. So Alhamdulillah, I'm not going to be a source of trouble. Humility is the essence. And that's why in Islam, really, there's inward deeds and outward deeds. And sometimes, so the outward deeds, maybe the monastic of Hajj, the outward performing of the Hajj, but the inward deeds is the sincerity, the humility, the remembrance of Allah. Those can be just as important, if not more important, because we can do all the outward deeds, but if we don't have the sincerity and the humility, then all our outward deeds will be worthless. And we can do great outward deeds, like Hajj, but if we come back with arrogance, or thinking we are something, or getting in fights with each other because we think we're something, then that may ruin all of our outward deeds. So the inward deeds can be more important. Of course, we need both. But remember, the outward deeds without the inward qualities and the inward character and the inward sincerity, humility can be worthless. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us humble servants of His. The mukhbitin. Allah says He loves the mukhbitin. He loves the muhsini. He loves those that cry before Allah, that talk before Allah. Use this opportunity to humble yourself before Allah, to talk to Him, to recognize we are nothing. He is everything. We, to ask Allah to treat us not according to our deeds, but according to His generosity, to free our hearts from arrogance. And this is an opportunity we can talk a little bit more in the future about the importance of being humble servants of Allah. And if you go on this hajj trip, being humble, fighting against arrogance, trying to perfect your good quality and your good deeds, inshallah, it will be a hajj that is accepted. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those whose hajj is accepted and, and from the people whom even the, the people around us, their hajj is accepted through our humility, through our dua, through our good deeds, that we don't waste any time in this trip, that we don't harm anyone in this trip, that we be very forgiving, loving, patient, 
grateful, humble servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we make the most of this trip. We come back as the day our mother gave birth to us, free from any sins, either as it relates to Allah or as it relates to each other, and that we continue these good qualities for the rest of our lives with the tawfiq and barakah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khayran. It's been an honor to speak before you today. Please remember us in your du'as and I look forward to seeing you very soon inshallah on our hajj trip together. Subhana rabbika rabbil azzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.